on behalf of IHS board, faculty, and staff, I want to thank you all for coming this evening. And um, IHO, most of you know this institute for a few decades, right? And this institute has been evolving through those years. And now it's more of a multidisciplinary institute that not only deals with paleoanthropology, but also research on human cultural evolution and behavioral ecology, evolutionary genetics, and non-human primate behavioral ecology, and so forth. And it, it's one of the ways that we try to program this event is to reflect that multidisciplinarity of the Institute. So you've noticed like through, through the few talks that we had before this one, we've talked about fossils, we've talked about genetics. And now we're gonna talk about a little bit about the other stuff that we do through a wonderful speaker that we have for tonight. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Ian Tattersall, who really needs no introduction, but I will try. Um, so Dr. Sarasol is curator of curator emeritus in the Division of Anthropology of the American Museum of Natural History. He was trained in archaeology and anthropology at the University of Cambridge and geology and vertebrate paleontology at Yale University. His training tells you that he is a true Renaissance scientist who has worked on everything from limer ecology and systematics to the analysis of the human fossil record and its integration with evolutionary theory. And he doesn't just theorize. He has vast fieldwork experience that spans the globe. Uh, some of the countries where he has conducted field research include Nigeria, Madagascar, Mauritius, Yemen, Vietnam, Suriname, and Borneo, and the are just a few countries that he's been, uh, he's been at. Dr. Tarasol has received numerous awards throughout his career, including IHO's Lifetime, Life, Lifetime Achievement Award, and the W.W. W. Howells Award from the American Association of Anthropologists. Now, it's also, I'm proud to say that he is a member of IHO's executive board, particularly as he embodies everything that IHO represents, the integration of paradigm shifting research and public outreach. In addition to all of his groundbreaking scientific studies, he is also a prominent interpreter of human paleontology to the public. He has published many books on human evolution for the general public, as well as several articles in um, journals like the um, Scientific American. And uh, he's also been one of the people who've, um, who've been a co-curator of the highly acclaimed Hall of Human Origins at the American Museum of Natural History, arguably one of the most influential exhibits for the public's understanding of human evolution. And in addition to books and exhibits on human evolution, as proof of his Renaissance scientist status, he's also co-written several books on the natural history of wine, beer, and spirits. For <laughs> Currently, uh, his, his major research focus is on how modern humans acquired a unique style of thinking and how we as humans managed to dominate the planet while other human species went extinct. And tonight, he's going to share with us his thoughts on this particular topic, the origins of modern human cognition. I know that you're just as anxious as I am um, to hear him speak. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor in uh, Dr. In Tanso. <laughs> well, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, Yanis, for that very fulsome in introduction. Uh, what he didn't say was probably I'm going to annoy uh, pretty much uh, all of my colleagues who are present here. Uh, tonight, but it's really, really wonderful to be here speaking on behalf of the uh, the uh, Institute of Human Origins, which, as you know, uh, really uh, punches well above its weight in paleoanthropology and really has been a formative influence over the last uh, several decades. Now, 
what I'd like to do this evening is to give you my uh, personal take. And, and I do emphasize that this is a very personal take indeed and painted with a very, very broad brush about how we human beings came to be the rather extraordinary and uh, somewhat bizarre and improbable creatures that we are today. But before I start, oops, let me see. Uh, do I have any slides here? Um, here we go. All right. I just had to figure out what to do. Yeah, before I speak, uh, I start. Let me begin with something that I've learned to emphasize whenever I speak uh, about human evolution, even to very sophisticated audiences. And that is that there can be no doubt that we Homo sapiens are fully integrated into the great tree of life that unites all living uh, organisms um, on this planet. And we see that tree here in a circular form, but I think you'll, you'll agree that some branching uh, structure is clear with all organisms, including human beings, ultimately emanating from a single common ancestor. So there is no question about it. We human beings are an integral part of the uh, natural world. But it's nonetheless also evident that we're not simply just another run-of-the-mill primate because there's undeniably something unique, qualitatively unique, about us. And it's something that stems ultimately from the very unusual way in which we process information about the world in our minds. Exactly what it is that sets us apart, of course, is a very elusive uh, thing to, uh, to characterize. But I think it's usefully summarized by saying that we human beings think symbolically. And what that means is that we mentally dissect our exterior and our interior worlds into a vocabulary of mental symbols. And then we rearrange those symbols according to rules to imagine alternate versions of the reality we're living in. And as far as we know, no other organism treats information in anything like this way. Now, that is, of course, not to suggest that the cognitive processes of uh, primates and other vertebrates cannot be very uh, complex indeed. And our close relatives, the uh, great apes, can, for example, readily recognize and respond to visual and vocal symbols. And they, they can even use them additively uh, to make and to understand simple statements like, take red ball outside, as these bonobos here appear to have done. But the apes evidently cannot generate the alternative realities that we do by rearranging those symbols in the human fashion. Which means, of course, that we're separated from them, and as far as we know, from all other um, <clears throat> uh, organisms, by a narrow but hugely significant cognitive gulf. Still, as, as uh, witnessed by our place in a tree of life, there can be no rational doubt, of course, that our symbolic and our linguistic species was descended from an ancestor that was neither of uh, these things. So in other words, at some point in our evolution, an ancestor must have bridged that symbolic and cognitive gulf. But the question, of course, is how was that done? Well, in broad terms, there are basically only two uh, alternatives. One of them is that, as many believe, we acquired our powers of language and reason gradually over vast bounds of time under the guiding hand of natural selection. And that would imply that we are somehow molded by nature to be the kind of creature that we are. And that is very different from the alternative possibility, which is that we, we, we achieved our current cognitive status abruptly in a sudden acquisition that would imply a non-adaptive element uh, of chance. Well, you know, choosing between these two alternatives might sound uh, like, like a technicality, but in fact, knowing exactly how we human beings became the way we are is actually, I think, essential 
to understanding what it is that we have become. And that turns out to be pretty tricky because cognition is an abstract quality that doesn't preserve either in, in the fossil or the archaeological record. There is no direct record of ancient cognition, which means that when we try to visualize the cognitive states of early hominins, we're entirely limited to using indirect proxy evidence. And that evidence mostly comes uh, from the archaeological record uh, that uh, humankind has been leaving behind itself for the last uh, roughly three million years. And for much of that time, the archaeological record, as you see here, uh, consisted almost entirely of uh, stone tools and butchered animal bones and of the ways in which these elements were scattered around at, uh, at uh, ancient occupation sites. And while it is true, I think, that we can learn a lot about ancient hominins from technological indicators like these, they are really unreliable proxies for any specifiable cognitive condition. Which means that, in practice, scientists have differed wildly in their views as to what an acceptable archaeological proxy for symbolic behaviors of the kind that characterize us today might be. Well, to cut a very long story short, my own feeling on this matter is that while many Stone Age technologies are certainly very impressive indeed, most tools are strictly functional items. And while those technologies can, as such, certainly tell us a great deal about the general complexities of behavior, the only really reliable proxies we have for modern symbolic cognition are artifacts that are explicitly symbolic in nature. Now, on the face of it, this requirement of overt symbolic significance seems like a reasonable standard to uh, to adhere to, but it's complicated by the fact that opinions may legitimately differ as to what can and cannot be considered a symbolic artifact. Can we, for example, uh, regard a symbolic, a roughly, uh, a roughly altered lump of stone that, like this one here, looks vaguely anthropomorphic to a modern observer? Uh, can we accurately view pierced and colored gastropod shells like the ones we see here as symbolic? Or can we view as symbolic ground ochre that might or might not have been used for symbolic purposes such as bodily decoration? Many, many questions. And there'll always be tricky cases like these. But fortunately, certain early expressions uh, were more overtly symbolic. So it's unlikely, for example, that anybody will dispute the idea that a fully cognitively modern individual drew uh, this representation of a horse on a cave wall in Spain some 20,000 years ago. Or that the person who drew this geometric design at around the same time in France was the intellectual peer of everybody else in this room. And perhaps most importantly of all, Symbolic thought allows hominins with clever hands, which Lucy already had three million years ago, not only to remake the world in their minds, but to change it in practical ways as well. And the consequent ability to impact upon the environment should surely be expected to express itself in some major visible inflection in the uh, material record. Well, with all this in, in, in mind at the back of our minds, let's briefly look back in time to see at what point in human evolution we can reasonably infer that our predecessors had begun to behave uh, symbolically. But before we review the material record, let's look at this very, very uh, uh, generalized uh, family tr human family tree that we see here. Um, and at what is very bushy shape, as you can see, suggests about the processes that gave rise to it. Typically, as you can see, multiple hominid lineages flourished in uh, parallel throughout hominin history, with as many as seven different lineages 
coexisting at any one point in time. And clearly, there's no way in which we can interpret a diagram that looks like this as the product of the gradual and continuous improvement of our lineage that most of us were taught about in school. So let's bear that in mind too as we take a closer look at the material record to see if we can detect when and, and what exactly happened. Well, the earliest purported hominids uh, consist of a rather ill-assorted handful of poorly known forms, all of them from the continent of Africa. And they're between about seven and four million years old. And all of them, including the oldest one that we see here, owe their hominid status largely to claims that they moved upright when they were on the ground. And that bipedality of theirs was clearly the foundational adaptation of our hominin subfamily. Without it, we could never have become who we are today. Uh, now, the slightly later Australopiths of between about 4 and 1.5 million years ago give us a much fuller picture of what was going on. And here's the earliest Australopith cranium discovered in northern Ethiopia not long ago by Johannes Haile Selassie and his colleagues. And of course, the genus Australopithecus itself is best known from the slightly later species Australopithecus afarensis, which is most fully represented by fossils found at Hadar in Ethiopia by Don Johansson and other IHO scientists. And now, These fossils all show, I think, that simply walking upright didn't immediately bring along with it all of its modern consequences. Those relatively diminutive and short-legged osteropiths were certainly bipedal when they were on the ground. But they had wide hips and rather short legs that um, gave them a rather different gait from the one we have today. And they retain numerous features of the uh, skeleton, particularly the upper body, that indicated that they were agile in the trees as well. And what's more, their brains were only slightly, uh, modestly larger than, than those of apes are today. And like apes, they had very strongly um, projecting faces, like uh, this example in the middle of this image here, which was discovered by IHO's Yoel Rack is compared to a human on the left and to a chimpanzee on the right. And you can see in which uh, direction the general resemblance lies. But despite this generally superficially ape-like resemblance, the osteopiths do seem to have been much more ecologically adventurous than their ape uh, relatives were. And for example, they exploited a much wider range of resources than um, modern apes typically do in similar environments. And although they left no hint of symbolic cognition at this very early stage in hominin evolution, they were clearly on a distinctive evolutionary trajectory uh, from the very beginning. Well, at about three million years ago, we begin to pick up intimations that early hominins were moving toward the manufacture or the use of stone tools to butcher animal carcasses. And not long after that point, sites that uh, yield deliberately manufactured stone um, sharp flakes like this one become a common feature on the African landscape. And they show beyond any doubt that humans at this point had moved cognitively well beyond the uh, ape league. But despite this radically new behavior, in anatomical terms, the earliest stone tool makers seem to have been pretty much standard Australopithecus, uh, standard issue Australopiths like the one we see in this image here. And that gives us the first indication of a very significant pattern that we find throughout the human fossil record, which is that new technologies do not tend to be introduced by new kinds of hominin. And this is a theme that soon repeats itself with the appearance of our own genus Homo. The earliest fossils of, of, of Homo are found in the continent of Africa at sites around two million years uh, old. And here's one of them that was described not long ago by 
uh, IHO scientist Gary Schwartz over here and his colleagues. And unlike the Australopiths, these early homo were taller, slenderer, and longer-legged, as shown in this reconstruction. And they have significantly expanded brains at this point. They were physically suited for life out in the spreading savannas far away from the ancestral, the shelter of the ancestral forests and woodlands. And for energetic reasons, it's also reasonable to conclude that they had already assumed an at least partially a predatory way of life. And yet they were still associated with the same simple flake tools that their predecessors had already been making for a million years. And it took a while before they started regularly to make a new kind of implement, the large and bifacially flaked hand axe seen here that was for the first time made to a predetermined form. Now, tools like this became common in Africa at around the one and a half million years ago, and they continued to be made for a very, very long time. But although several different species of the genus Homo came and went in the intervening period, it was not until about a few hundred thousand years ago that a conceptually new kind of stone tool began to be regularly used. That was the so-called prepared core tool that we see here, in which a stone nucleus of uh, good quality was elaborately worked on both sides until a final blow would detach a more or less finished implement. And once again, these conceptually more complex tools appeared well within the tenure of a uh, existing uh, hominin species. Now, the species involved this time was the one we see here, Homo heidelbergensis. This was the first hominid that lived throughout the old world, and its fossils show up in both Africa and Europe at about 600,000 uh, years ago. And appropriately enough for a hominin that was very, very crafty indeed, it had a brain that was well up towards the modern human size. And we knew that this species was really smart because the prepared core cool, cool tool was not its only invention. Because within the time span of Homo heidelbergensis, several other radically new technologies were also introduced. They included carpentry, with the apparent fitting together of these wooden construction elements that were recently reported from the site of Colambo Falls in uh, Zambia. They also included the building of the shelter reconstructed here at a 380,000 year old site in France. And other innovations of Hylobagensis, including the hafting of stone tools into handles to make them infinitely more efficient. Uh, the regular use of fire uh, is found and the first finely shaped wooden throwing spears like this one were also uh, the work of uh, Homo heidelbergensis. But significantly nothing produced in the period of Homo heidelbergensis is uncontestably symbolic. So what Homo heidelbergensis seems to be telling us is that it's possible for a hominin to be resourceful, to be smart, to be behaviorally flexible and very technologically sophisticated, all in the absence of any convincing evidence for modern symbolic reasoning. And we can also say the very same thing, I think, for the slightly later Homo um, neanderthalensis, which of course was a, uh, a Western Eurasian hominin that evolved there from uh, indigenous predecessors at about 200,000 years ago. The Neanderthals had brains as big as ours, as you will have noticed, and they were wonderful craftsmen in stone, as you see from these implements here. And they left us an incomparable record of very complex lives. They flourished in an age of difficult climbers. They hunted some fearsomely large animals like these woolly mammoths here, and at least occasionally, they buried their dead. So they were really a, a, a phenomenon. But despite the straws, the odd straw in the wind, the Neanderthals nonetheless bequeathed us very little convincing evidence that they possessed any consistent tradition of symbolic activity. Now, 
Saying that is not to disparage the Neanderthals in any way. Clearly, the Neanderthals were very complex beings, and they were clever exploiters of their environments. But it is hard to avoid the impression that the Neanderthals interacted with the world around them very differently from the way in which we do today. So evidently, again, there is more than one way to be smart. Ours is not the only way to be a smart hominid. And even more amazingly, perhaps, the very same thing also appears to have been true of the earliest fossil representatives of our own uh, species, uh, our own very distinctively uh, different anatomical species, Homo sapiens. Now, Homo sapiens clearly evolved in Africa, and we know this because the earliest fossils that show substantively modern morphologies have been found at Ethiopian sites that date to as much as 230,000 years ago, and here's a slightly more recent example. But significantly, those early anatomically modern Homo sapiens are associated with some very archaic toolkits, including this very late hand axe. Oops, there we go, back again. This very late hand axe that was picked up not far from where the, uh, the skull that we saw, uh, just saw, was found. Now, obviously, members of our species eventually began to reason symbolically, or we wouldn't be here today uh, talking about it. But although hominin life was obviously picking up in complexity and variety in the later part of the Pleistocene, it's not until about 100,000 years ago that we start to find significant indications of our own symbolic cognitive style. And once again, those indications show up in Africa and nearby. At about that time, uh, pierced uh, marine shell beads like these and ochre deposits too start to show up at sites along the Mediterranean coast and in uh, South Africa. And although it's true that these indications by themselves are arguable, perhaps, as indicators of modern cognition, they're soon supplemented by much more direct evidence for symbolic activities. The best evidence of this kind comes from the 77,000-year-old Middle Stone Age occupation strata at the site of uh, Blombos Cave in South Africa, close to the uh, continent's uh, southern tip. And among other things, those strata have yielded smooth ochre plaques that bear engraved geometric motifs that appear to have retained meaning over time. This is the most complete example we have of a plaque of this kind, and the deliberately engraved geometric symbol it bears makes the most convincing evidence, direct evidence we have for early, explicitly symbolic human activity. And it was recently joined by the world's first uh, um, known drawing seen here. Also from Blombos, this is an abstract design that was drawn 73,000 years ago on a piece of silkrete using an ochre crayon. And at the same time, technology was also roaring ahead in a way that was unknown before, as attested to by such highly complex activities as the fire hardening of silkrete flakes such as these, which was first um, uh, documented by uh, IHO scientists at Curtis Marion's fabulous site at Pinnacle Point about 100 kilometers to the east of Blombos. And Curtis has uh, argued very uh, eloquently from other evidence as well that the Pinnacle Point people were behaving in the unique modern symbolic way at around this time and possibly even earlier as well. Now, all of these early expressions of modern minds were evidently the work of anatomically modern Homo sapiens. And because of this, a fairly firm scenario, I think, of modern human origins and geographical dispersion is emerging. Namely, that Homo sapiens, as exemplified by this Ethiopian individual, had appeared as a distinctive anatomical entity in Africa by around 230,000 years ago. 
Now, at first, members of the new species behaved pretty much as their predecessors had done. But by around 100,000 years ago, they were beginning to show new and unprecedented behavioral tendencies that included the production of symbolic objects. And very soon after that, as this map shows, populations descended from those first symbolic humans, exited the continent of Africa, and very rapidly took over the entire old world. This exodus had very radical consequences because from this species here, Homo erectus in the Far East, to Homo neanderthalensis in the far west of Eurasia, all hominin competitors promptly disappeared. And less distressingly, possibly, in the best documented case of early behaviorally modern penetration of remote Eurasian regions, the dazzling tradition of European cave decoration was already underway by about 40,000 years ago. And that was part of an artistic outburst that included musical instruments, such as this flute, and notations such as those on this plaque here, and some of the most exquisite portable art that was ever made. What's more, recent evidence re indicates that a rock art tradition that was comparable to the European one had also emerged in Indonesia by about 45,000 years ago, which does suggest, I think, that the traditions of representational art that we now see both in Europe and in Eastern Asia had probably originated in Africa earlier yet, and necessarily soon after the emergence there of symbolic cognition. Now, of course, human beings are complex creatures, and we are descended from complex precursors. And from time to time, of course, we do find uh, unusual expressions in the uh, records those precursors left. Here is one of them, a half million year old pattern of incisions on a mollusk shell that was found at a place called Trinil in Java, intuitive association with that ex now extinct species, Homo erectus. But while expressions like this are intriguing, intriguing, one swallow doesn't make a summer. And items like this are floating points that were not embedded in any identifiable larger uh, symbolic traditions. And I think that's a very, uh, very significant point. Whereas, in dramatic contrast, the entire tenor of human life was clearly and dramatically changing in the later African Middle Stone Age and then on up into the Upper Paleolithic of uh, Europe and uh, elsewhere. In the short period between about 140,000 years ago, which is a short period indeed, a fundamental behavioral transformation was taking place in Homo sapiens and sparking a revolution in the way in which hominids did business in the world. Previously, hominins had met environmental challenges by adapting old technologies to new purposes, rather than by inventing new technologies, as we tend to do today. And hence the typical uh, long periods of stasis between major changes in the toolkits that we were looking at earlier. But with the emergence of behaviorally modern Homo sapiens, a clearly a totally unprecedented entity was on the scene. And it was an entity that clearly possessed the very same restless appetite for change uh, that um, we uh, possess today. So, how do we explain the rapid emergence of the extraordinary and basically unprecedented new symbolic phenomenon in just one lineage of the genus Homo, which had many lineages. Well, slow and, and, and gradual adaptation by natural selection is obviously no answer in the case of a dramatically short-term event that clearly took place within the tenure of an existing biological species. So, we have to ask ourselves, what happened? Well, let's start with a plain fact that human beings could never have begun 
to behave so differently had they not already possessed the neural underpinnings that permitted them to do so. And we know of only one biological event in which those novel structures could have been acquired. And that, of course, was the, the radical developmental reorganization that resulted well over 200,000 years ago in the highly derived skeletal anatomy of the new species Homo sapiens. You can see how very distinctive we are um, anatomically by comparing the very highly specialized human skeleton on the right in this image here with that of the more representatively ancestral Neanderthal that we see on the left. And this comparison makes it very clear that the genetic alteration involved in the speciation of Homo sapiens had cascading developmental consequences throughout the skeleton from head to toe. And very plausibly, those changes extended beyond the bones that are what preserve to include crucial changes to the soft tissues that uh, include the, uh, the, the brain, of course, which do not uh, preserve, that we cannot observe. But the lag in the archeological record nonetheless indicates that the new neural and cognitive potential that was born at the origin of Homo sapiens, that lay unexploited, the new potential lay unexploited for a short but significant period of time. During that time, anatomical Homo sapiens continued to behave in the old manner, producing an, an unremarkable archeological record. But then something happened to stimulate the recruitment of the new behavioral potential, much as ancestral birds only very tardily discovered that they could use their feathers to fly. They had feathers for many, many, many millions of years before recruiting them for flight. And because the biology necessarily had to be there already, the stimulus involved in the human case was necessarily a purely cultural one. So what was that stimulus? Well, by far the most plausible candidate we have is the spontaneous invention of spoken language in some small isolate of a clever hominin species that shared the African landscape with other clever and complex relatives. That's plausible largely because language, which depends on a vocabulary of vo vocal symbols, is the ultimate symbolic activity. Language maps onto symbol symbolism perfectly. And indeed, from our own modern perspective, it's virtually impossible to imagine um, a thought in isolation from language. The linguist Wolfram Henson has, for example, recalled the very close uh, connection between grammar and thought. And he's even suggested that thought itself is inherently grammatical. And in other words, language and modern thought are so closely intertwined that they appear to be functionally, if not conceptually, inseparable. Now, it's certainly legitimate to argue that while all modern human beings are symbolic, they do not all necessarily leave behind preservable symbolic objects. But I think we might reasonably expect that over the long haul, any species that processed information in the modern way would have left us some consistent material indication of that fact, just as we have ourselves so extensively done in recent millennia. And we simply do not find anything that's even vaguely comparable in the case of any extinct hominin species, not even the big-brained and well-documented Neanderthals. And what's more, the invention of a spoken language by a biologically predisposed hominin could easily have been just as instantaneous as the material record suggests that it was. On a theoretical level, for example, Noam Chomsky and his colleagues have recently argued that the algorithmic basis 
for languages, it is an extremely simple one involving a single cognitive switch. And field linguists have observed structured sign languages to emerge virtually instantaneously and to develop very rapidly among communities of deaf children housed together for the first time. Now, this property of suddenness not only makes language a particularly credible driver of symbolic reasoning, but it also distinguishes it from all other rival stimuli for symbolic thought. And what's more, in addition to its internal importance in organizing thought, language is an externalized attribute that would have been poised to spread very rapidly within any population that was already biologically enabled for it. So in this scenario that I'm proposing, language and symbolic thought are inextricably intertwined in human history. And both were simultaneously acquired by Homo sapiens in a single short feedback event, an event that was both recent and emergent. And it was an exaptive event and not an adaptive one. Which also, by the way, very neatly explains how the highly derived modern vocal tract was already in place when it was needed for the expression of language. Because as essential as they may be for producing speech, the distinctive proportions of the modern vocal tract that we see on the left of this image here, they evidently originated as a simple byproduct of the retraction of the face beneath the front of the skull that is the most uh, fundamental cranial feature of the anatomical species Homo sapiens. And that, of course, means that the modern vocal tract just happened to be there when it was required to produce language, as indeed it had to be. And just one final thought. Counterintuitively, after two million years of expansion, our brains have shrunk significantly since the end of the last ice age. Both the, uh, the Neanderthals and the early modern Europeans who replaced them something like 40,000 years ago seem to have had brains of approximately equal volume, making both something like 13% bigger than the brains of people typically are today. And because brain is a particularly costly, um, uh, metabolically costly tissue, this reduction suggests to me anyway that the ancestral intuitive hominid brain operated on a brute force algorithm in which intelligence, however you might wish to define that, scaled more or less directly with brain volume. But in contrast, the new symbolic algorithm was not only more effective, but more metabolically frugal. It demanded a lower input of energy for a product that just happened to make its uh, possessors significantly more effective in the competition for ecological space than any other hominid that had previously existed. So effective was it, in fact, that the early symbolic humans rapidly cleared out the competition and bequeathed us our unprecedented status as the world's only hominid. And I cannot uh, you know, overemphasize how unusual that is. Now, the remarkable powers of reasoning that omitted this rather dubious achievement were clearly acquired both amazingly recently and in an abrupt event that was entirely random with respect to adaptation. And that strongly suggests to me that we human beings have not been programmed by eons of evolution to behave in specific ways that may or may not be inappropriate to our new self-created environment. Instead, what happened, I think, was that the abrupt adoption of symbolic thought changed all of the cognitive rules. And knowing that we were accordingly not burnished over eons to be a particular kind of creature is actually incredibly important to our own understanding of ourselves. 
most importantly, I think, it helps us to understand why cognitively we are still such patently unperfected creatures. At best, we're a work in progress. It helps us to explain why our decision-making processes are typically so messy. Who knows what crazy stuff is going on in this guy's mind here? And it, often, it also explains why we so often cherish crazy ideas and believe fake news. It explains why, for all of our amazing reasoning powers, our human behaviors are so frequently irrational and self-destructive. And perhaps a little bit more reassuringly, it helps us to understand that these imperfections are the price that we pay for our precious ability to reimagine the world around us and to make our own choices about how to live in it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I, I want to, first of all, uh, congratulate a uh, very biased opinion uh, since uh, Ian has been uh, for decades one of my closest uh, friends in the field of paleoanthropology, a field that has, as you know, been injected with uh, way too much testosterone, <laughs> conflict and controversy, as Ian would say, uh, and to, to thank him for drawing together so many of the threads that keep us all awake at night as paleoanthropologists, trying to understand uh, from an archaeological, from a paleontological, from an evolutionary uh, point of view, uh, the, the core of what the Institute of Human Origins uh, really is. And that is uh, what I sometimes call uh, the human career, uh, how we became human. I think we've got a long ways to go on that front, but how we became homo sapiens and in control uh, of all this lovely planet that we live upon. And uh, Ian, uh, there are going to be very interesting conversations, I think, tonight around the dinner table about uh, much of what uh, Ian said. But I also uh, want to express my dearest appreciation to uh, Julie Russ uh, and to Lindsay Mullen. who are, are the unsung heroes who put all of this together from the Institute at uh, Arizona State University. Uh, the Institute of Human Origins will be 44 years old next year. I wish I were going to be 44 years old. And um, we're going to be celebrating uh, not only the inception of the Institute, uh, an organization which has been dedicated to understanding this question that we all ask ourselves as children, uh, where did I come from? But also a year to celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of the reappearance of a little creature who was nice enough to die on the edge of a lake 3.2 million years ago and be become fossilized and to begin to stimulate us about some of the earliest stages of uh, the human career, uh, some of the earliest and most remote ancestors that, of course, re resemble a common ancestor to the African apes and ourselves. Uh, for me, it will be a unique year. I was 31 years old when I discovered Lucy, so you know that I will be 81 next year. And I, I'm just having turned 80, uh, I, I'm beginning to understand that 80 is perhaps the new 80. But um, we'll try to overcome that. But uh, the other uh, wonderful uh, opportunity that we have tonight is that uh, many of our colleagues uh, are here volunteers at the American Museum of Natural History, of course, uh, but also uh, colleagues who are very active in the field of paleoanthropology, the study of human origins, 
uh, who come and support us on these evenings and uh, certainly add immeasurably to our conversations. Uh, this coming year is going to uh, demand a, a great deal of me in terms of travel and so on and so forth. But I wanted to remind all of you that uh, early Wednesday morning, and we've talked about millions of years, as Ian did, or hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, we think of tens of years ourselves, I guess. But early Wednesday morning, when most of you probably in the East Coast were asleep, uh, there was a um, NASA mission known as the Lucy Mission, uh, that uh, was traveling at about 10,000 miles an hour, some probably, what, 300 million miles away, uh, that passed by a asteroid named after the Ethiopian name for Lucy, which is Dinkanesh, which means you are marvelous or you are wonderful, uh, and uh, recorded for the very first time, this was in the normal asteroid belt that we talk about and know about and we learn about in school. But here you think that the, our solar system was created about four and a half billion years ago. So it took a very long time before Homo sapiens began w walking on this planet. But we're talking about numbers in the billions of years, in the hundreds of millions of miles. And the incredible level of technology that this species has achieved. Uh, my wife, Robin, is here tonight. We were at the launch two, year, two years ago uh, in uh, southern Florida to see this craft take off with this spacecraft on it, uh, which is uh, armed with various sensors and detectors and so on into space, uh, which is, as we all know, a pretty big place. And uh, that NASA and Hal Levison, who is the chief scientist, uh, and we are meeting later this month in Denver at the Denver Museum of Natural History uh, to discuss the intersection of the world of, of space research and the world of paleoanthropology, but they have been able to come within 400 miles of this little dot that is less than a half a mile in diameter and to be able to make photographs of that and to realize that it is not only a single dot, but it also has a moon rotating or revolving around it. So the cognitive leap that Ian spoke about has had repercussions that are virtually unknown anywhere else in the universe so far. Where I live in California, I rub shoulders with a number of people who work at SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and I love meeting them at cocktail parties and saying, anybody call? <laughs> but uh, we are a unique species. We are a highly influential species. We are a species that, for better or worse, of course, is in touch with its, not only its own destiny, but the destiny of all of our fellow travelers. And as a species that has the technological ability, the foresight, and the ability to do something like the Lucy mission, we should be able as a species to cooperate in a way that we can assure our descendants of a time when they will look back on their ancestors. And we are involved and faced at the moment with, I think, a very critical moment in terms of human evolution. And one of my major messages this next year as I travel around the world talking about uh, my discovery of Lucy is that it is terribly important for us 
to understand, as uh, Ian spoke about, that uh, we are, in fact, in spite of these technological innovations, uh, still part of the natural world. Uh, the book which stimulated my launch into studying human origins was by Thomas Henry Huxley, and it was called Man's Place in Nature. And I think with so much of what has happened in a very, very short period of time has interrupted our knowledge that we are really still part of the natural world and that what we do will influence and affect positively or negatively all life on this planet, including ourselves. There's no other place for us to move to. That pale blue dot that my late friend Carl Sagan spoke about is extraordinarily unique. We are so fortunate to be here as human beings and to be so different and unique from each other. When I was teaching in the classroom, I used to tell my students how fortunate they were, and of course they'd love to hear that. And I said, why, are you, why do you think you're so fortunate? They sort of shook their head and I said, because you're going to die. And they would look at me and they'd say, what? And I said, the only reason you're going to die is because you were born. A few changes in your genetics, you'd be somebody else. So it is time for us as a species to become even more introspective about who we are, where we're going, and how we can preserve this incredible experience of being on this pale blue dot. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you.